So as we discussed before, we have four major regions of the brain. We have the cerebrum, we have the diencephalon, which encompasses the epithalamus, the thalamus, and the hypothalamus. We have the brain stem, which consists of the midbrain, the pons, the medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum. So let's go ahead and begin with the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is the largest part of our brain. It contains motor, sensory, and association areas that will process somatic sensory and motor information, something that we're gonna see later. It also forms the superior part of our brain. The cerebrum is divided into the left and right cerebral hemispheres. Taken together, they approximately account for 83% of our total brain mass. The superficial layer of our cerebrum is gray matter. What exactly is gray matter? Well, we're going to look at that layer as well, that we refer to as the cerebral cortex, which is sometimes referred to as the executive suite of the nervous system. Basically, it's our conscious mind. So before we get into the details of the cerebrum, let's look at some of these structures, beginning with the gyri, or gyrus, is a series of elevated ridges found nearly on the entire surface of our cerebral hemisphere. So if we're talking about one elevated ridge, which I'll highlight to the right, then that's referred to as a gyrus. If we're looking at two or more of these elevated ridges, or two or more of these gyrus, then we refer to it as gyri. Bottom line, these gyri increases the surface area of our cerebrum. There are two important gyri that we're going to be talking about in this presentation. We have what's called the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. Another structure is referred to as a sulcus. So what is a sulcus? A sulcus is a shallow groove that separates these gyri. If we're looking at more than one of these shallow grooves, then we refer to it as a sulci. So turning to this image on the upper right-hand corner, here is your shallow groove, which again is referred to as a sulcus. And if we have two or more, then it's referred to as a sulci. The main sulcus that we are going to be focusing on is referred to as the central sulcus, something that I'm going to point out with these images that you see in this slide. Then we have the fissures. So what exactly are fissures? Well, fissures are deeper grooves that separates large regions of the brain. So we have three fissures. We have the longitudinal fissure, we have the transverse fissure, and we have the lateral fissure, which sometimes is referred to as the lateral sulcus. So please know that. So let's first look at the longitudinal fissure. So the longitudinal fissure is what is going to separate our cerebrum into the left cerebral hemisphere and the right cerebral hemisphere. Now please note, this is the anterior and this is the posterior. So once again, this longitudinal fissure is what's going to separate our cerebrum into the left cerebral hemisphere and the right cerebral hemisphere. Along this longitudinal fissure, we find the Falk's cerebri. So the Falk's cerebri is one of those dural folds that we mentioned earlier. Now, in addition to the Falk's cerebri, we also find the superior sagittal sinus. So this superior sagittal sinus is one of those dural venous sinuses that I would like you to know. Now, in addition to the superior sagittal sinus, we find another dural venous sinus, and we're going to include here inferior sagittal sinus. So in addition to the superior sagittal sinus, we also have the inferior sagittal sinus that is found along this longitudinal fissure. The next fissure is the transverse fissure. So this transverse fissure that I'm going to highlight in green, what we find in this transverse fissure is another dual fold, referred to as the tentorium cerebelli. So this dural fold that runs along this transverse fissure is what's going to separate the cerebrum from the cerebellum. The last fissure is the lateral fissure, also referred to as the lateral sulcus. So this lateral fissure, also referred to as lateral sulcus, is what's going to separate the frontal and parietal lobes from the temporal lobes of the cerebrum, something once again that I'll point out later. Now, before we move on to the next slide, I'd like to discuss this central sulcus. 
Okay, so I'm going to highlight the central sulcus. So this central sulcus is running perpendicular to the longitudinal fissure. So I'll make an illustration to the right. So if this is the anterior part and the posterior part of our brain, the longitudinal fissure runs in this direction, while the central sulcus runs in this direction. So basically ear to ear. Now, the gyrus that is directly anterior to this central sulcus is referred to as the precentral gyrus. So if we dissect this word, pre-central gyrus, pre means before. Before what? Well, before the central sulcus. This is why, once again, it's referred to as pre-central. Now, the fact that it's an elevated ridge is why we call it a gyrus. Now, the gyrus that is directly behind or posterior to the central sulcus, we're going to refer to it as the post-central gyrus. So it's this area that is highlighted in green. So post means after. After what? After the central sulcus. Here's another image showing us the central sulcus. Right? So the central sulcus once again runs ear to ear and it's perpendicular to the longitudinal fissure which you can't quite see with this view of the brain. But what we can find is the lateral fissure. So the lateral fissure once again, is what's going to separate the frontal parietal lobe from the temporal lobe. And along this area is where we're going to find the transverse fissure, where we find the tentorium cerebelli. Let's now talk about the three regions of the cerebrum. So we have what's called the cerebral cortex. This is the most superficial part of our cerebrum. And what we find in the cerebral cortex is superficial gray matter, something that I'll point out in a moment. And then we have what's called the white matter. So this white matter is the internal part of the cerebrum. And why is it called white matter? Well, we're going to talk about that as well. Then we have the basal nuclei. So the basal nuclei are clusters or islands of gray matter within this white matter. So let's look at this image down below. We have the uh, cerebral cortex, which is the first region. And once again, this is the most superficial part of our cerebrum. So what does it consist of? It consists of gray matter. Gray matter is where we find the cell bodies of our neurons. Cell bodies, of course, can sometimes be referred to as somas. So if you recall, the soma or cell body is where we find the nucleus of the neuron. What else do we find in this gray matter? Well, we also find unmyelinated axons. Remember, the axons that are not containing myelin sheath are referred to as being unmyelinated. Well, this is what we find in the superficial gray matter, which gives us the cerebral cortex. Now, how thick is the cerebral cortex, which I'm going to get ready to highlight in green? So, folks, this is not a very thick layer at all. So this superficial gray matter, this cerebral cortex, you're looking at a thickness of less than half an inch. The fact that I'm able to talk to you, the fact that I'm able to move my hands, the muscles of my face as I talk, and the fact that I'm able to feel is because of this superficial gray matter, this cerebral cortex. Once again, this is the most exposed part of our cerebrum. Then deep to that lies this white matter. So I'll highlight part of it in yellow. So this area that I'm highlighting in yellow is white matter. So this is directly deep to the cerebral cortex. So why is it called white matter? Well, it's because white matter, what we find, are mostly myelinated axons. So they contain myelin sheaths. And of course, that is due to those oligodendrocytes, one of the neural glia or glial cells found in the central nervous system, which of course our brain is part of. So in this island of white matter, we find clusters, right? Islands of gray matter that we collectively call the basal nuclei. So the basal nuclei, once again, are islands of gray matter within all this white matter. So we're going to be looking at these basal nuclei and what they consist of as well as their function.
So let's now look at the cerebral cortex, the uh, outermost layer of the cerebrum that consists of superficial gray matter, the so-called executive suite of the nervous system. So why is it referred to as this executive suite of the nervous system? Well, it's because it controls higher mental functions. In other words, all our conscious thoughts, sensations, memory, complex movements, and all intellectual functions originate in the cerebral cortex, this layer that is the most exposed part of our cerebrum. So it consists of four lobes. We have the frontal lobe, we have the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. Now, sometimes there is a fifth lobe that can be considered. It just depends upon which anatomy book you're looking at. So we call this so-called fifth lobe as the insula. So let's find these four lobes. So I'll number them in according to the list that's given on the top. So here is our frontal lobe. So the area that is in pink is the frontal lobe, both the dark pink and the light pink. Now, what about the parietal lobe? So the parietal lobe takes on this purple color, all right? So let me go ahead and highlight that. So the parietal lobe is the area that's in this purple. So dark purple, light purple, parietal lobe. The third lobe is the temporal lobe. So we'll go ahead and highlight that region. So this area that sort of takes on a salmon color, this is all the temporal lobe. And we have the occipital lobe that takes on this sage color. So once again, let me go ahead and use the green highlighter to highlight the occipital lobe. So if we use a pair of retractors to pull away, to separate at this lateral sulcus, which again can also be referred to as the lateral fissure, only then can we find the so-called fifth lobe. That's referred to as the insula, this area that I'm highlighting in blue. Now if we look at these images down below, what we have are multiple layers of neurons. And we can see all the cell bodies of these multiple layers of neurons, and this is why this is referred to as gray matter. Now, please note, I'm not expecting you to know these layers of neurons. 